that, that's really what it's all about. And that it doesn't matter if it's a bird, a dog, or cat. I know someone that's taking miniature donkeys to mm. nursing homes. So it's just, mm. it just creates that beautiful feeling of being around a wild animal or domesticated animal. It doesn't make any difference. Right. It just really just makes you feel so good. Now, now you mentioned uh, miniature donkeys. Now, when they bring those into the nursing home, are, are the people looking like, oh, am, am I supposed to be a jackass now? Because they're bringing those donkeys. Little, little mini asses running around. <laughs> Check this out. We got a great show coming your way today. Hi, everybody. Are we ready? You ready? Yes, today is the founder and president of a private wealth management firm and guess what guys he's a first time author he wrote the uh telling book a tale of love life lessons from scrappy um a pet therapy dog and we're talking about pet therapy today and i think with so many animal lovers across the country this is a great conversation you guys don't want to miss it we're getting one-on-one with larry right now People are gonna probably ask, what does pet therapy have to do with life in general? What if I'm not a pet lover? What if I'm not a pet owner? What would you say to those listeners or watchers? Well, first, that's a shame. <laughs> Everybody needs a pet of some sort, and I'm gonna be the next in line. But the uh, pet therapy is really all about comfort okay. and sharing what an animal can give to a human and share that compassion and uh, make them feel better. That's really what it's all about. Okay. And how did you grow your infinity for animals and, and your love for them being a comfort in, in, in so to speak? Well, it started early with me. I mean, growing up, we grew up in North Carolina out in the country. We always had animals around, uh, whether they were domesticated or wild. And mm -hmm. so I always had an appreciation for animals, but, um, I met Scrappy in upstate New York, and uh, she came into my, my life uh, that time. And I was actually dating a young lady who had a four-year-old son that was just too rough. You know, she mm. was only five pounds. And so uh, when we stopped seeing each other, we agreed that uh, it was best that she came with me. So in a sense, she was a rescue dog, not in the traditional sense, but uh, in that sense. But then we relocated to uh, Tennessee, where we are now. And there's a children's hospital in the area. And it was our way of getting to know people in the area. We moved here sight unseen, did not know a soul. Mm. And so uh, I've heard about the pet therapy program and just knew that Scrappy would be a good fit because she just loved to be around people. All right. And, and so would you say you, you kind of got Scrappy in the divorce? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I got I got the good end. <laughs> okay. All right. Now, how important is it for people? Let's say, you know, because again, there's a host of people across the country who own pets who are animal lovers. Mm -hmm. How important is it to them and for those who may be, let's say, on the fence about whether or not I should get a pet or, you know, I think sometimes people see pets and animals in one light when actually it sounds like from you, they could be utilized for a number of things that help people in everyday life. Is that correct? Absolutely. The, the thing that you got to understand about pets is that, and particularly dogs, when you pet a dog, there's a reaction in your body, a hormone gets released. It's called oxytocin. Mm. And oxytocin rela releases stress and tension in your body. And you know it every time you touch an animal, you just feel better. Mm. And that's really what it's all about. And it's particularly important now because we've had to deal with COVID for so long. And we've all heard about the mental stress that uh, COVID has created. And so when you have that ability to either own or have access to a dog, I know people that just go to the animal shelter and sit, you wow. know, just so that they can be around the animals. And uh, they're just you know, they're just loving creatures. They want to be around other people that love them. And that's really what pet therapy is all about. And it's that ability to have that chemical reaction in your body that just physically makes you feel better, makes you emotionally feel better. 
and um, makes you forget about everything that happened during the day. <laughs> All right. Now, you mentioned, a, uh, 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 I, I guess we would coin that a medical term. You called it oxy what now? Oxytocin. Is the oxytocin. Whole... Now, yep. some people are going to hear that and say, is that the same as oxytocin? <laughs> no. <laughs> Those are not Absolutely. Things, right? No, 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 no. Completely different. <laughs> Completely different. Okay. And, uh, but, you know, unfortunately, where I live, the other one, oxycodone, is, is just way too prevalent. And so what happens sometimes is animals will be asked to come, you know, pet therapy dogs will be asked to come to the hospitals just to create that release because it's been demonstrated medically that with the release of oxytocin, uh, you can actually begin to reduce medication mm. for patients and um, you know get them off some of the habits that they might be on now what classifies an animal as a pet therapy type of animal like do they have to go through four years of college is it like some (laughs) night school classes they have to take how how, how does that work it's kind of like night school but it is uh, an organized training session and there's really four key processes that have to be completed the, the basic training is just obedience. You know, how does your dog respond to your commands? Honestly, the two most difficult things I think for most dogs is in our training, they put a hot dog on the floor mm-hmm. and you had to walk within two or three feet of that hot dog and your dog could not respond to it. It could just look at it and just keep on going. So as a the handler, you say, leave it, leave it, leave it, and just keep walking by. And so that is what you want your dog to do. Because the reason that's important is in our case, we were in a children's hospital. Mm-hmm. So anytime you're in a hospital or a nursing home, unfortunately, there are accidents. There could be a drug of some sort on the floor. Mm-hmm. And so you don't want your dog to eat it. So that's why that part of the obedience training is important. The other one is being out of sight. You don't want your dog to react negatively if you have to go around the corner and they can't see you or there's a loud sound or something like that. So the dog has to go through a regiment of obedience training. The uh, dog has to prove that it can get along with other animals, other humans. So there's Mm -hmm. a temperament aspect of it. And then the rest is really the handler. The person who actually owns the dog that's going to be walking around through whatever facility um, you're going to be visiting, they've got to be verified with background checks, that type of thing, to make sure that there's nothing that um, would cause concern, Mm -hmm. you know, if you go into a children's hospital. And then the fourth step is to be observed. If you're going to go into a hospital, there's going to be someone there to watch you and just make sure that you're following their protocols. Every institution has their own protocols. Okay. And so a hospital is a little bit more strict. How does pet therapy help people? And where would someone like myself, because I think I mentioned this uh, when we met, that I I want a pet. Um, I've just been kind of on the fence about mm-hmm. not whether or not to get one, but what, what type of a pet I was actually going to get. Uh, and when it came to a dog, I, I always wanted my whole life, I wanted a a bulldog, and then I was told uh, about how much it, not, not how much it costs, but the type of care that a bulldog needs, and I looked at it like, I don't know if I have the schedule to care for a bulldog the way it may need, and, and just looking at some of the health concerns with a bulldog, uh, and then I, I thought about a, I thought about a pit bull, but it wasn't something I was actually going to, um, because I, ha- I have a childhood trauma when it comes to a pit bull uh, uh one of the kids in the neighborhood who owned one when we was kids sick his pit bull on me and, and oh no i just never wanted one and i know people use those in in the wrong way but yep. just kind of for myself thinking about what type of pet that i would want at this stage in my life but uh i want to ask you how does pet therapy help people and, and where would i find uh a pet therapy in action Well, the answer to your first question is, you know, pet therapy helps people in a wide variety of different ways. One is by sharing your animal with someone else. They're going to make, just make them feel better. It's like I said, that oxytocin gets released, that stress and tension gets removed from their bodies. 
And in our situation, because we're at a children's hospital, a couple of things happen. One is the last place you ever expect to see a dog is in a hospital. Uh -huh. So it's a nice surprise. And it provides that avenue of release. Because if you're just lying in the bed, you're just wondering what's going to happen next. And then you're surprised by this animal and you get the opportunity to pet on it. And it just takes you to a different place. And so that's a wonderful thing. As the handler, I got the most benefit out of it than anybody. Because I got to see the appreciation that these children have for animals and take them away from the pain that they were dealing with. Um, you know, we sat with a little boy that was going through chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. He cried the entire time, but he never took his hand off of Scrappy. Mm. Never. It calmed him down a little bit. He still cried, but it wasn't at the levels before. So pet therapy is not only for the patient that you're going to visit, but it's also for you. You get the ability to appreciate what you are doing. It's a way of giving back to the community. It's a way of philanthropy mm -hmm. without having to spend the money. Um, so where are you going to see it in action? There's a couple of different places that you can go. One is you may see it at your hospital. You, they've just opened up, by the way. You know, okay. the, one, the one locally was shut down due to COVID until April 1st. So now the dogs are beginning to come back in go to maybe a university or a college nearby. You know, the universities have learned that pet therapy helps to the point where now 60% of the colleges and universities in the U.S. now have a pet therapy program. Wow. And it just allows the students that time to get out of class, away from the library. In fact, you know, I would never know anything about this. It's way beyond my education level. But Yale Law, you can go to their library and rent a pet therapy dog. Really? Yeah. Yeah. And it's, again, it's just the whole idea of taking you out of that element where you were, give your mind the opportunity to relax and just breathe a little bit. And then you've got something there that's just going to love you unconditionally, as we always say about dogs. Now, when we talk about pet therapy, are we talking about petting the, the animal or are we talking about the animal itself being a pet, or is that both? It, it's really both. Okay. You know, the, the reality is that when you go visit someone, the idea is when you start rubbing and petting that dog, that's when you get the sensation of the oxytocin running through your body and all that stress and tension goes away. Okay. Now, now you talked about earlier about uh, being in the uh, children's hospital. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was thinking about when you're talking about a, a, a a cancer patient uh, as a child, in, in, in other words, how emotionally draining is that for both the, the handler and also the pet? That's a great question. And I'll tell you why, because they put limits on your visitation. Okay. They understand that uh, it is going to be emotional uh, process for both the animal and the human, the handler. And so, we would spend as much time as we could. Um, but honestly, Scrappy would come home and the first thing she would do is go get on her blanket, lay in the sun, and she was wiped out. So wow. the, the, the animals bring that emotion into themselves. And that's what makes pet therapy so beautiful is the fact that the animal is willing to give of themselves. And for me, it was emotional, but I intentionally never asked any names. I never asked what their problem was. Hmm. That would just be too much. There were other situations where in one particular situation, a nurse came up to me and said, we're having problems with a child that came in that had been sexually assaulted. Wow. And they said it was done by the father. We don't want you to be seen. We don't want you to say a word be quiet. Is it okay if I just take Scrappy into the room? Mm. And so I said, of course. So she came out and she was in tears because that little girl was surrounded by seven nurses, all female nurses. But all I heard was, look what we have. You want to pet Scrappy? Feel how soft she is? That's mm. what I heard. 
And so when she came out and was just in tears, she said there wasn't a dry eye in the room, but it allowed that little girl to recognize a couple of things. But the most important thing was that she was safe and those female nurses were there to protect her. But she just could not calm down until Scrappy came into the room and allowed her that opportunity to think of something else. Wow. Okay. I'm going to bring some of my friends in right now, Larry. And Excellent. They're going to ask some questions as well. Let's welcome Mika and JB. Hello. Hello, Hello Logan. Uh, Larry. It's Larry. <laughs> I'm Larry. kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> All right. So, so um, we're talking about pet therapy. And, you know, initially when you hear that term, you could think, oh, it's a it's about me petting a pet and that mm -hmm. becoming therapy. Or it could be about the pet itself. Um, just as, as Larry has said, pets bring so much joy in the lives of so many people across our country, mm -hmm. uh, which is why so many people own, own pets. And I'm going to ask you guys, do any of you guys own pets? I do. And I didn't hear him. I don't think he can help me. I have two parakeets <laughs> and I need some pet therapy for them. When I'm on conference calls, it sounds like I'm in the wilderness. I'm like, what can I do to, you know, soothe them? So it sounds like this is more for the, the cat dog. I, and I'm just, you know, there's no help for me. But I do understand how pets uh, really help people. I see the service dogs and I hear people with anxiety that just get a pet and it just changes things. Uh, not saying it's like medication, but it does help them. Right. Yeah, that's that's exactly right, because whether it's the birds or anything, I mean, the birds are there for you. Mm -hmm. I mean, you get that sensation when you're around them. That they just bring that pleasure. I'd love to hear that in the background, to be honest with you. I think that would be a great, <laughs> great experience. But um, that that's really what it's all about. And that it doesn't matter if it's a bird, a dog or a cat. I know someone that's taking miniature donkeys mm -hmm. to nursing homes. So it's just, it just creates that beautiful feeling of being around a wild animal or domesticated animal. It doesn't make any difference. Right. It just really just makes you feel so good. I think no, it's the companionship no, no. as well. Um, yeah. You know how we all want that unconditional love. And that's mm -hmm. what a lot of pets are. They don't judge you. You can come in, you can, you know, you can do anything and that dog is still going to follow you everywhere you go unconditionally and love you regardless. So I definitely get it. That's that exactly true. right. Now, now you mentioned uh, miniature donkeys. Now when they bring those <laughs> into the nursing home, are, are the people looking like, Oh, am I supposed to be a jackass now? <laughs> little, little mini asses running around. <laughs> it's just one more. <laughs> <laughs> hilarious hilarious yeah um jb you got a question yeah i do i was gonna i was gonna piggyback off the question that you asked earlier finch when you were talking about someone who doesn't have a pet like me we, we don't we don't currently don't have a pet now um is there a way to choose a pet based off of one's personality mm. regardless regardless of what kind of pet it is yeah i think that's a great question and you know, what I've done in the past is uh, if you want to adopt a, a dog, for example, or any kind of animal, just go to the shelter. But here's what I do. I sit on the floor, sit on the ground with that animal and just see how they respond to you. I think that's one thing to make sure that you're going to be compatible, you know, just from a personality perspective, like you said. I think the other very important thing is know your lifestyle. You know, a lot of people love to jog. So they're going to take their dog jogging with them. And they're not going to take the bulldog with them. Mm -hmm. You know, they're going to look for a different type of breed, a, a different mixture that's going to be suitable for that type of activity. I know a lot of people that go hiking, they want another dog that can keep up with them. So it's really all about what your lifestyle is, so that it's going to match what the dog is capable of. Now, J JB was probably asking Larry about uh, retired canine dogs that he can utilize. That's 
that's really what that if you see there if, if you look deeper into his question <laughs> you, you know jp better than me so <laughs> he was really and, and, trying to figure out how he can get this dope so you know and, uh, and thanks you touched on something as well saying you didn't have enough time for a certain type of pet and i know there's a lot of elderly people that i know um my son's grandmother she wanted a dog and there's certain dogs that are for that you know retired people that have all the time like taco spaniels be Sean Free say that just need a lot of attention and just want to mm. sit there. Um, so I do like like you said, you have to know what you want to do. You want to jog? Right. Or are you going to be in the house all day knitting? There's dogs for that that just want to sit there, less activity. Yeah, yeah, that's that's exactly right. And so by knowing what it is that you are looking for, not necessarily in a breed, but like I said, from an activity perspective, it's really just going to make um, the fit with you, your animal, if you have a family, that much better. All right. Uh, Larry, in your book, A Tale of Love, uh, Life mm -hmm. Lessons, what are two lessons that people can grab from this book that they can apply to their everyday life? All right, I'll share a serious one and then a funny one. How's that? Okay. I think the very first chapter is called Love is Responsibility. And, and what I mean by that is I'm going to go back to when Scrappy was sitting next to that little boy getting his chemo treatment. You know, one of the beautiful things about dogs is that when they look at you, they've got those enormous, beautiful eyes. Mm -hmm. And they just look up at you and they just melt your heart. And I would watch Scrappy do that. And when that little boy was going through his chemo treatment, she was not only staring up at him, but she just kept nudging closer to him. Mm. She would just take her little butt and just kind of move over. And that to me is the epitome of what Scrappy was all about. She understood her responsibility and she knew that love was a responsibility. And we can take that on ourselves as humans. Uh -huh. You know, we need to understand that we need to love each other and, and accept that as our responsibility and just make sure that we incorporate that into our daily lives with whether it's our friends, our significant others, spouses, whatever the case might be. So that I think is one of the more important lessons mm -hmm. uh, in the book. Um, there's another one. Um, now, before you go to the next okay. one, I okay. got a follow up because you just go said ahead. something very keen. Loving with responsibility, love being a responsibility. How can one love responsibly? Mm. I think there's a couple of ways that can do it. I, one of the things I, I write about is, you know, sometimes we get in these relationships where we say, I love you all mm -hmm. the time. Mm -hmm. And because we say it all the time, sometimes it may be in passing and it may not be, it just becomes habit. Mm -hmm. And so what I encourage people to do is when you are serious about the person that you're with, take your hands, put them around their face like this and stare at them and let them know I love you and just give them that feeling that you know this this is real it's sincere and I think we can do it not only with like I said our spouses uh, significant others whatever the case might be but um, just incorporate it to those people that are very important to us okay all right all right so you go, you're going to give us another uh, life lesson that's funny so I write about the way that Scrappy, in my opinion, became a great pet therapy dog was the fact that I allowed her to explore. We traveled together. You know, we lived in upstate New York. A lot of my business was down in the city. I'd take the train and sometimes I'd take her with me. And uh, she'd sit on that inside seat and she would just watch people get on and off the train. It was like she was watching a tennis match. Mm. That little head was just going back and forth. But those types of things just gave her exposure to life that most animals never get the opportunity to experience. They're stuck in their backyard somewhere. And so I think that allowed her to develop as a dog. I think it allowed her to... Um, be more adaptable as a pet therapy dog. But I, I like to say that in order to explore, we need to poop in as many yards as we can. Because if you're just going to poop in your own backyard, you're never going to learn anything. 
Excellent. And so again, the same thing applies to humans. We got to get out of our own yards. That's right. And go explore a little bit. Go poop in somebody else's yard. You know, oh, my neighbor's gonna love me tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what you doing, Mika? Yeah. What is this? <laughs> no, right there. I have I have a question. You may not. I know you're not tapped into their minds, but you mentioned your dog. You know, looking back and forth. What is it with dogs loving to be out the window of a car with winds going 100 miles per hour? <laughs> I don't know. What, what, what do you think that is, that feeling? It looks like they're in heaven just getting all the fresh <laughs> air. And maybe that's what it is. You know, maybe it's the fresh air. It's the feeling of, you know, their, their fur being brushed back. I, I honestly don't know. It could be the different sense that they're getting. Uh, you know, as they're driving by, you know, dogs have that ability to smell far away and a variety that's of different true. things. So maybe that's just part of it. But uh, I, my favorite is to see the Great Dane sticking his head through the sunroof. The sunroof. <laughs> yeah, you know, we, we got we had a couple of those in town, and it's just yeah. that's quite the sight. All right. Mm -hmm. And All I right. have one more question. You got one more? Okay, go ahead. I do. The book. You said it's a tale of love, or a tale is love. Tale of love. A tale mm -hmm. of love. And I'm a pretty witty person. Tail. Is that T-A-L-E or T-A-I-L? T-A-I-L. I like that. Very yeah. witty. You about to be out here wagging your tail out in the streets. <laughs> <laughs> no, when I heard a tale of love, I was like, oh, I hope he spelled it, you know, like the tail of a dog. Yeah, you know, me could talk about. You know, Larry said, "I just I, if I have my tail out, that's love." No, no, that's what I think I do tomorrow. I'm blaming on Larry. My neighbors are gonna love me. This is good. The other thing I tell people is, you know, happiness starts with the butt. Ah. <laughs> I like that. Yeah, you hear that, you hear that, baby? <laughs> 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 oh, no. oh I, I had another question for uh, for Larry too. Yeah. Um, are there? Can you tell what breeds are better for making therapy dogs than others? No, I I don't think there is such a thing. That's my personal opinion. Okay. Um, I think honestly, the most important thing is that you know we teach animals how to be. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if we're nice, they're going to be nice. If we treat them bad, they're going to be bad. That's our responsibility to make sure that their life experience is going to be as good as what we would want. And so I think when you consider pet therapy, um, breeds really don't matter, in my opinion. Now, some people may have a different opinion on that, but I think it is important when you consider um the size of the dog and where you want to go. You know, Scrappy was small. She sat on my forearm. She was five pounds. She was perfect for a child. But if you got a Great Dane or something like that, or a Rottweiler, beautiful dogs, friendly dogs, loving dogs, but the size may be too intimidating for a child. Mm -hmm. But that might be great on a college university campus, mm -hmm. you know, where you've got that size of an animal and it's certainly going to get everybody's attention. You know, Scrappy is not going to get anybody's attention on a college campus. She was just too small. But a right. big dog like that would really just be ideal. So I think that's that's one of the important things to consider when it comes to pet therapy and, and the type of dog. It's more size than the type. Right. right. All right. One last question before we let you get, go, Larry. What is one question you wish you were asked more often? Hmm. Probably why, why pet therapy? Uh -huh. And I would have to say that it was much of what you brought up at the beginning, Finch, is there's the animal experience mm -hmm. and the human experience. And I think from a human perspective, the pet therapy created um, experiences that I could never replicate ever. And it brings you centered. It allows you to appreciate your health, your life. Um, and you have an appreciation for the other family and what they're dealing with. And so it really just brings you back to center and makes you as much a person as you can possibly be. Mm. 
Now, Larry, I, I, I noticed, and this is probably not the way you should end, but I, I noticed you spoke of Scrappy in a past tense. Yeah. Is Scrappy no longer with us? Correct. Uh, she passed away June 30th, 2019. Okay. Okay. And, and how, how has living without Scrappy been for you? Uh, and I'm not talking about like her absence, but she, she sounded like she was so full of life and she get she did a lot. She did just as much for you as you did for her probably. So how has that void been? How has it been coping with that void in, in this time period, especially you know, she passed away before COVID and now you have to go through that whole experience uh, without her. Yeah, that's a super question. Um, it, it's it been difficult, you know, particularly early on. Um, you may not know this. The book was an accident. Oh. I never intended to write the book. But what happened was when she passed away, that the challenge is your routine. Your routine is gone. Mm -hmm. And so how, how do you feel that when it's absent? And that was the emotional pain that I had to deal with. Um, and so what I ended up doing was I would take a piece of paper and I would rip the corner off of it and I would write a note and I would put it with, you know, her ashes. Uh -huh. Well, those notes became letters and then the letters became stories. And after um, the first anniversary of her passing, I decided I wanted to collect them and get them organized. And I just went away. I went into the woods. I found a cabin that I could rent. And I just started writing. I got things organized. And I kept writing. And so writing became my therapy. Mm. It allowed me to uh, get the emotions out, which I still do. Mm -hmm. It allowed me to reflect and recall all of those wonderful mm -hmm. memories that we had, whether we were traveling or at the hospital or any other situation that we were in. And, but now the book is her legacy. Mm -hmm. You know, I get to pass along to you and your world, my world and everybody else that's listening, the opportunity to share how great an animal she was and do two things. I encourage you guys to get off the fence and get a dog or a pet. Mm -hmm and encourage you to get off the fence and consider pet therapy because mm. i mean just from a human perspective it's one of the most beautiful things you could ever experience mm. wow and well listen, scrappy lives on forever that part yep mm -hmm. um it's been a pleasure having you um and i'm telling you like i didn't know what the conversation would be and where it would go and i can tell you i am very amazed at this conversation and all the things that have developed and came out from it. And we so appreciate you coming on the fence and having this conversation with us and our audience. Hey, thanks for tuning in. Be sure to give us a follow, rate us and leave a comment because we love to hear your thoughts. And until next time, get your ass off the fence.